Good afternoon. Konnichiwa. It's an absolute delight and pleasure to stand in front of you, to see you all, <clears throat> uh, to have gained a new community of friends and family here in Japan on this uh, very interesting topic. And it's particularly touching for us to um, have been recognized by the Asahi Foundation and uh, together with my dear friend Bill Rees, who has spent wonderful years in the early 90s being back together. It's like the band is coming back together. And, and also the great hero of mine, Tom Lovejoy, not just being a scientist, but having brilliant ideas and following them into execution, for example, through Debt for Nature Swap. And I cannot wait to see your presentation, Tom. And to be here with many of my friends and collaborators, uh, including Susan Burns, with whom I started Global Footprint Network 10 years ago. Uh, and uh, we have worked ever since on that and left and, 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 and uh, lost a lot of sleep over it, to be honest. And then dear friends, Katsu, colleague, Iha, and, and, and uh, Yoshi-san Wada, uh, who have worked with us tirelessly. It's just a great pleasure to be here with you all and the United Nations University for hosting us here. Uh, thank you so much for being here. I start with a picture that when you look at it, you may see disaster. What I see in this picture is an incredible learning opportunity. It's the Tacoma Bridge. It sounds like a Japanese name, but actually it's a bridge close to Seattle in the United States that without human loss collapsed in 1937 after swinging for some time and has been studied ever since by engineers. And in fact, all engineers, all structural engineers in their first course in structural engineering are shown the movie of how this bridge collapses, how it's important for engineers to understand physics that their decisions matter. That's why it's a learning opportunity. And that's how we approach the sustainability challenge. Because when you ask an engineer about a bridge to say, is it strong enough? They will make calculations and they will tell you perhaps there are two beams missing. We should add two more beams. And they're never asked, are you an optimist or a pessimist? Why are you so pessimistic to say two beams are missing? The engineer just says, I'm an engineer. Two beams are missing. And that's how I'm going to talk about the challenge ahead. Because I'm an engineer myself originally, proud of that. I'm sure there are a lot of engineers here. As High Foundation is run by engineers and run very well. So the bridge I'm going to examine is the following. Not are there two beams missing, but why are resource limits now undermining our economic performance? But of course, with the purpose, what can we do about it? And the starting point is a very simple one, to invite you to think like farmers. I think that's the, probably the transformational idea to say, if nations were characterized like farms, which ones would be true farms? Here shown as creditors or in green, which ones have far more biocapacity? in their own boundaries than what it takes to feed the population, absorb their waste, provide all the ecological services necessary to support them. And back 50 years ago, I'm just turning 50 a week from now, so I'm still in my early 40s here. That's how the world looked like. Most countries were true farms. And in just my lifetime, the world has changed quite significantly. Today, 83% of the world population lives in countries where the population consumes significantly more than what their ecosystems can regenerate. And how do we know? We know it through a very simple accounting tool. 
which we call ecological footprint. That just says, ultimately, life competes for space, space to produce a fish, and either the seal gets it or I get it. You know, so we're in competition for that space. Space can be understood by people because we are visual, but also scientifically, I would submit, it's a very useful unit to account our demand on nature. Why? We could account in energy, but it's not that easy. The sun powers the earth with about 175,000 terawatts, a lot of terawatts, and then, then get transformed in about 200 terawatts of biomass. So when we say terawatts or energy, what do we exactly mean? Or if we measure the world, as many do, there are very interesting studies on net primary productivity. How much are ecosystems producing? What was hard to, to measure then, when you look at the forest, is now how much is being produced and how much is removed. If we just say there's forest, there's forest area, we can quite precisely say how much timber product is being generated and how much is being removed. And through that, we can have this comparison of how much do we have and how much do we use. And I think that's at the essence. Any economist or accountant would tell you, just by knowing how much money you earn, but not knowing how much you spend, that's not that useful. We need to have this comparison, demand and supply. And that's what we can do with surface. We can say, how much surface do we have that exists in the world? And then on the other hand, how much does it take to produce everything we need? And so we can compare. So the secret is a very simple one, and I'm going to tell you. It's just knowing how many tomatoes do we produce in our garden, how big is our garden, we divide that number, that's called yield. That's the only secret. There's a second slight complication you may remember from high school, that you are allowed to swap these two parts. You know, and then the true formula is amount of resources that we use divided by the yield gives us the area necessary to provide this flow. Very simple. Like with money, it's very simple. How many yens do you get? How many yens do you spend? So it's very simple. We also use a common currency because there are different currencies in money. Yens, dollars, euros, Swiss francs. We translate our numbers in one currency called global hectares, average hectares. So we can compare. For example, Germany. German surface, on average, is 20 times more productive than the world's surface on average. So it makes a difference how productive it is. For example, if you have just one hectare that is, let's say, as an example, twice as productive as world average, we would count it as two global hectares. And vice versa, if the hectare is not that productive, let's assume just about half, then it would only be worth half a global hectare. Very straightforward. So now, with all these principles, you can go and calculate your own footprint of anything you want. I gave you the secret. So let's come back to this idea of the world. Now we know how to measure the world as if you were farmers. And I've also given you some results. We call it a bit like a Swiss pocket knife. You can open it, and there are lots of these um, tools in there to see who has how much. There is a warning. It's an origami warning on top that once open, you cannot fold it back. But uh, it's, a, it's a price well uh, worth paying for opening it and seeing what happens. But I think the key insight from looking at this perspective is the following. That maybe, maybe we do not have a global problem. Maybe what we have is a global storm, meaning we are in a big storm in different boats. We are in a boat as a city, as an investor, as a country, as a continent, as a region. We recognize, oh, there's a hole in the boat. Oops. How do we react? 
would it be wise to say, I will not fix my own boat until you all get together somewhere in a convention to agree to fix your boat first. Then I will fix my boat too. Not a very wise approach. And so I would say that's probably even bigger than the market failure of climate change is the biggest policy failure, that this fundamental insight of self-interest we have not discovered yet, that we believe it's worth wasting our future while waiting for global consensus. Now, global consensus will help, but waiting for it may be too costly. So let me just show you some examples from countries I've visited over the last month and we worked with those governments. How it looks at it looks from a, from a national perspective. So what you see on these graphs, the green line, is how much Colombia here they have per person in Colombia. There's now less because there are more Colombians. The red line shows how much they're able to consume. That's the ecological footprint. Per capita hasn't changed that much in Colombia over the last 50 years. And I had a wonderful conversation with the director, one of the five directors of the Central Bank of Colombia. I told him biocapacity, we believe, is the currency of the 21st century. At the end of the conversation, he told me, not only that, the global hectare, it's the only currency backed up by reality. I was quite stunned by that insight because, in essence, that's true. Ecuador, neighbor country of Colombia, one most of biodiversity rich countries, they had about four times more biocapacity in 1960 than they used. They have been able to increase their consumption per person, the red line going up slightly. Uh, and at the same time, this can turn, I think you can see it, okay, here. Uh, the green line going down largely because of a larger population in Ecuador. Now, Ecuador being one of the first countries in South America living with an ecological deficit. When they saw this curve, they said, are you against the right to develop? They call it el derecho al desarrollo. And so clearly we said, no, we are totally for el derecho al desarrollo. But this looks like el derecho al colapso. Not so much in their interest. And indeed, they said that's true. And they now have a national goal to say we need to move out of our biocapacity deficit. It's bad for us. They did it independently of the climate negotiations. They actually launched this idea two weeks before independently. And it's quite interesting. And I'm not sure I'm allowed to say that at the UN University. But from the UN convention perspective, Ecuador having a low income would have been asked not to do anything about climate change, which actually in the end would be in their, not in their self-interest. So it's interesting to kind of reverse the idea and say, what actually does it mean to live in a boat as we enter a global storm? I was in Turkey talking with the Ministry of Development and Economy, and they start to recognize that it's getting tighter. And that may have implications for the economic performance. Been in Italy, and you say, wow, Italy, a G7 country, very large biocapacity deficit, shows clearly that what Matis is talking about has nothing to do with reality. Oh, Italy being such an industrial power. So what's the cost of biocapacity deficit? And I would like to unpack that for you. First, to look at this biocapacity deficit that now Italy essentially uses four times more than what Italy has. And when you unpack it, you see a big part of it, the blue part, is the fossil fuel part. They have to buy from other places. They don't have the capacity to absorb in their own country. And they also need some extra food. That's how much they have. Now, what's the problem? Let's look at how much they use. That's the amount they use. And let's look at what the cost is. So the price for resources has been going down in the 20th century and has been going up in this century. So as the amount of biocapacity deficit for Italy is increasing and the cost is increasing too, when you multiply it, what you see is that while the costs were flat for, for Italy early on, suddenly they have skyrocketed. 
It's still a smaller percentage, but what it means is that the downward escalator of costs for Italy is going faster than the Italians can run up. So it's this cost, this systemic cost that is exploding in an already fragile economy. Now is Italy alone. And I show you now a, ver a, a, a graph that they said you should never show a graph with 24 graphs on one page that can, nobody can understand. But it's 24 European countries identified with internet codes over the last 50 years. And what you can see is that the dynamics for each country is very different. Every boat is different. It's not one slippery slope. It's different boats. Poland, Russia, UK, Switzerland, where I'm from. But four countries have some very similar dynamic. Spain, Portugal, Italy, and Greece all had rapid expansion of, re of their biocapacity deficit at a time when the costs went up as well. And it's difficult for them now to pay for that increasing cost. So it's a predecessor of the cost explosion. So when we heard about, oh, sustainability is about the future, it's hitting us today. We could make the same and even stronger case about the Arab Spring. I'll be in Beirut a month from now where we launch an Arab-wide report where the numbers look even more dramatic. That's why we asked this theoretical question. Looking at planets in general, what happens when an infinite growth economy runs into a finite planet? And the secret answer is given here. You'll find copies for you outside. But the one key answer is this. It has economic consequences. It does strain societies. We are tempted to overuse resources even more aggressively. And indeed, for more and more people in the world, it is hard to even have two meals a day. Now, how is the situation in Asia? And I just wanted to show a variety of different dynamics and to show again how different situations can be. Vietnam is quite impressive how Vietnam has been able to increase biocapacity per person. Trends are not fate. You can change these trends if you pay attention. We have Japan on a quite high level, but flattening out on a per person perspective. South Korea, very rapid increase. We can also see economic crises. China, very rapid increase at the lower level, about two, with more than two global hectares per person right now. So large differences, different choices. But we're all on the same storm. Now, let me give you a tool to better understand how to think about the link between these resource stories and our economic performance, and why I have invoked the name of global auction. Let's start with a traditional view of how we look at the world. We say income is what we need to focus on, because with more income, I can resolve more problems, buy more food, more health, or more shelter. So it's really important to track, it's really important to track where my income is. And we add to that perspective and say, as engineers, we like locomotives, and we know locomotives without energy, they don't run. Even a beautiful locomotive doesn't run without resources. So let's see how many resources it takes to run this economy. Do they have the resources at home or not? And when we apply this and look at how countries have moved in this space over the last 30 years, that's the graph we get. We can see a movement of countries moving upwards in income. Most countries have increased their per person income, while at the same time, 
they also have moved towards the left, increased their biocapacity deficit, or running now a larger biocapacity, a, a, a smaller biocapacity reserve. So what does that mean? Let me give you three totally separate interpretations. Let me also emphasize that these different interpretations, they don't talk to each other. They have their own universities, they have their own newspapers, they have their own radio shows. And one interpretation is the following. They see clearly, obviously, what you can see is it's a good thing to use up your resources. The more you use up your resources, the higher your income. Wonderful, all on track. And then there are others that say, yes, we have made a lot of progress, and we can also see the strain on our planet. And on the weekend, we cry a little bit, we give some money to WWF, but Monday to Friday, that's what you gotta do, you know. And then we come home again on Friday, say, oh, have we paid some money to WWF? And then there's a third group. They say, do locomotives truly run without energy? In the United States, there were billions of passenger pigeons, and they apparently were very tasty. And they were easy to catch. And you could have big nets and catch them in big flocks. Sometimes the sky would be black of pigeons coming by. And you could get some money by catching them and shipping them to New York, and they liked them there. And people were so effective at catching them that suddenly they disappeared. It was hard to find, and one was kept in the Cincinnati Zoo. I think it died lonely in 1912. And that was the last one. And the pigeon, the passenger pigeon economy shriveled away. And that may be another interpretation of this graph. Who is right? And I think the way to look at this is by saying, what actually does this mean? First, to understand the scale of what's happening. So I'm putting in here, how much biocapacity do we have per person in the world? The two hectares Bill has talked about as well. That's what we have as a total in the world. And when we look at how much countries have moved in just 30 years, many have moved by that amount towards the left. Very rapid change in a very short period of time. And what we start to recognize is that perhaps this view of the world that we called factory world is based on an idea that resources are not constraining. That what's really constraining supply is our demand. If we want double as many iPads and iPods and iPhones and i whatever, then they will produce double as many. For me, I, me. <laughs> and uh, that's the factory world. Supply is limited by demand. Go out and spend more, and we'll produce more. And we have entered into a new world that we call overshoot, a full world, or that is char characterized by new dynamics. We call it the global auction. It's a global auction because we all, as countries, countries tend to want more and more of things they don't have themselves. So we put ourselves in competition for limited resources out there. It's like we all want these beautiful Picasso pictures, but they are not made anymore because Picasso is dead. So we are competing for the same pictures that we cannot live without, but perhaps we can even live less without resources. So that competition is an auction. And what matters in an auction is not so much how much you earn. It's much more important to know how much do I earn compared to you. Because if next year, I earn twice as much than this year. But you all will earn four times more than you did this year. Even though I'm wealthier in income, 
I will still not be as able to get my piece of the pie. So what we have to track in an auction world, and their GDP is very important, is not absolute GDP, but relative GDP, meaning of this beautiful global pie of global income, how much do I get from that pie? And is that increasing or decreasing? So I'm going to paint you the same picture that we have seen before with the same numbers, just from that perspective, shifting from an absolute income perspective to a relative income perspective. And that's how the world then looks like. What we see is that many countries, Switzerland, my home country, at a very high income level, so per Swiss, we get a lot of the global pie by selling chocolates and watches and pharmaceuticals and, and wonderful things. But compared to 1980, our share now has shrunk perhaps 30% of what the pie is. The pie has become bigger, our share has become smaller. So in absolute terms, we get more, but relatively to the total pie, we have gotten less. Now, Switzerland, having a fairly healthy government financial system, so not very high debt, we can ride the waves a bit better than other countries where we have a systematic double problem. On the one hand, we want more from the globe. Our demand on the limited stock of the world is increasing while at the same time our ability to compete, to, to bid for the resources in relative terms is declining. And we could call it even a triple challenge because it's happening in most places at the same time. So it's a systemic weakening of our overall economies. That's why we call it a global auction. Now, if, if we are higher income, like in Switzerland, you can say it's like a little cancer that is still relatively small. It, it, it doesn't affect you, but it's something, it's a growing tumor. Uh, but if you are low in income, particularly countries that don't have that much income and already run a biocapacity deficit, are becoming incredibly fragile. India, for example, very low consumption levels, but even less biocapacity and not a very high financial income to bid with the outside world, puts them at a very fragile situation. Let me just show some other countries, just same picture with more countries, uh, countries that have a lot of buying capacity per person, Australia, you see very rapid loss of advantage, Argentina, Brazil, New Zealand, we have Japan here, similar to the Swiss trajectory, United States, if you remember. Remember back like United States, Japan very similar to Switzerland. <clears throat> so a trend that, that we see around the globe. Now, if you still have extra biocapacity, you don't subject yourself to the competition for the global auction. You may profit from it, actually. It's interesting to see that those countries that own the true wealth of the 21st century are very quickly just giving it up. And that's what we also discussed, for example, with Colombia and saying, in such a world, what's truly in your self-interest? And as a Swiss, I want Colombia and I want Brazil to be far more restrictive with their biocapacity. Because we in Switzerland, we use about four times more than what we have in Switzerland. We depend utterly on the stability of Colombia and Brazil. So understanding our mutual dependence gives us all the right signals for us in Switzerland to say, maybe our biocapacity deficit is something to be careful about. And for Brazil and Australia and Colombia and Gabon, you say, wow, this may be the most significant piece of wealth that we have. Let's be very careful. So it's turning a negative sum game today that we say, okay, let's use up resources as fast as we can because it seems to generate income into a new game that's already supported by the economic realities of today, just that we haven't fully discovered them yet. But they are operating.
And that's why we are working also with banks and with the United Nations Environment Program. Actually, Susan is leading the effort with UNEP Finance Initiative, where we have a launch in, in, in London just a, a month from now, to look at that. To what extent are biocapacity deficits already today a liability to countries in terms of differentiating the ability of countries to pay back their debt? It's not about the future, it's about now. So, let me just give you the essence of how do we move ourselves out of this pickle? And I just try to distill it to just one thing. And of course that's simplistic. But I think it's a helpful guiding light to say, what would help us what would distract us from a safer, more prosperous future? And perhaps I can owe that to my grandfather who was a banker. And what we learned in Switzerland to say, save for the worst times. Think about wealth. Don't think about income as much. Because wealth enables you to maintain income. If we build income, while depleting our wealth, it will be less likely that we can maintain this flow of income. If we produce $100 or 100 yen worth of products and say, hooray, we generated 100 yens of income, and we forgot that it cost us 200 yens, we are not fully seeing the picture. If we choose our investments as individuals, if we buy a house, a car, investments in our portfolios of our pension. But as countries, in terms of what kind of infrastructure do we want to build? And we build it truly from the perspective of saying, what kind of investments will generate lasting wealth? Which kind of investments will produce assets that depend so much on resources that in a resource-constrained world, they become less and less valuable? We can choose clearly between, are we investing into traps, or are we investing into opportunities? And that's why I'm so proud of Japan, that we've had the opportunity to work with the Ministry of Environment to, as one of the first three countries, to look at the, our numbers and say, are they just totally plugged out of the air, or is there some substance to it? And Japan reviewed with a large group of esteemed academics, uh, the ecological footprint, to say, is it really representing reality as we face it? The other two countries were Switzerland and the United Arab Emirates that rose to the occasion first. And now, there are about 12 countries and a number of international bodies that themselves have reviewed the numbers to see, is it really a photography of their situation. France did it even without our collaboration, just using <clears throat> the material we have on our website. They were able to recalculate the French footprint within one to three percent time trend. And the number of UN agencies, and that's why I'm particularly pleased here to be at the UN um, uh, University. For example, the systems of environment and economic accounting is driving the new standards where we have been collaborating as well to, to see to what extent we can make sure our accounts are compatible and, uh, and we may be using the ecological footprint as an example of how to use these standards to consistently explain the country's position. And there are more countries to come. We'll just be launching with the president of the Philippines uh, in mid-November the first report from the Philippines supported by the French government as well. Um, and uh, yeah, as I said, in, in, in November, I'll be in Beirut uh, with a number of ministers from the Arab world looking at these trends as well, driven by a local organization. We just provide the numbers, but the local organization called the uh, Arab Foundation for Environment Development, driving this very question of saying, what's truly in our self-interest? What does it mean to succeed in a resource-constrained world? And with that, I would like to summarize key principles. <clears throat> of course, the biggest principle of all is 
that nobody can do it alone. We can do it alone, and that's why I'm so thrilled to see so many bright faces here in this room today, because we also need your help. This is just the beginning. So we are emboldened by the Blue Planet Prize, but it just says, please get started. And that's why we also will ask those of you interested in learning more about what we do, we have a little newsletter, we'll circulate these yellow sheets. If you're interested, it's going to be, it's an English newsletter, we kind of report about the world and the progress made, not just in Japan and in Switzerland and in other places, but we'd love to keep you informed because we also need your input and your wisdom. Because we believe truly it's a winnable race. It's not a Sisyphus work of saying, oh my God, we will never get there, but I'll do it because I want to die feeling good about myself. It's about a possibility that truly is shifting dramatically. Large changes in humanity have started from moral outcry, saying this is wrong, slavery is wrong. Colonialism may be wrong. Segregation, as we had it in the United States, is wrong. Apartheid is wrong. And it moves on to a point where we share a new dream, but also we start to see that economically we just cannot maintain the old system anymore. And we are at that point that economically the way we do it the old way is hurting us so badly that many countries and many currencies are feeling that reality very, very profoundly. And it's the few principles that I hope will help us redirect our boat, because like super tankers, you can't redirect it just two seconds before you kind of hit the rock. It takes some time to readjust and to have clear ideas. What are the key principles? One is that it is useful for an airplane to have a fuel gauge. It is useful for a country to understand how much biocapacity we have and how much we use, and to make choices about what's our self-interest, what level would be our optimal level. Because by a capacity, whether we like it or not, is becoming the currency, the most strongly supported currency by reality. And if truly we continue on this track, more and more so will we be subject to this global auction. And in a global auction, you got to track your relative income. And because of mathematics, not everybody can outcompete the average. So it's a very unstable strategy if you continue to believe that you can outcompete the global auction. It takes new strategies to succeed. But perhaps the most important piece is the following the most forgotten and the most obvious one. I sometimes say it as a tautology because it seems so obvious and you say, why do you say that? It's not even new information. It's the following. If you are not ready for the future, you are not ready for the future. That seems so obvious. And I think that's also underlying the fact that you say maybe <clears throat> there is actually a very strong self-interest and the maybe is actually more and more evidence points to that, that we are entering this global storm. We are in different boats. We make choices about our boat for our own investments, for our cities, for our long-lasting assets. And we believe, and I hope I've been able to convince you, that the self-interest to attend to this reality is overwhelming. And that's why I'm so glad to be with here, with you here, because I'm not inviting you to a game that we will lose. I'm inviting you to the biggest game in town with the biggest chances to be the champions. And we all can be the champions or none of us will be. And that's why I'm so glad to be here. Thank you very much.